if you if you don't bring a real bible don't come to church digital bible not allowed is that a good policy yes. but how many of you have digital bible today oops so shall i send you out okay all right luke chapter 4 verses 18 and 19 the spirit of the lord is upon me see the first sentence the spirit of the lord and that's what i saw the spirit of the lord so he came to speak the spirit of the lord is upon me because he has anointed me to preach the gospel to the poor he has sent me to heal the broken hearted to proclaim liberty to the captives and recovery of sight to the blind to set at liberty those who are oppressed to proclaim the acceptable year of the lord amen, amen. but technically now this is a quotation from isaiah chapter 61 verses 1 to 3 when the lord jesus christ quotes this in luke chapter 4 Uh, chapter 4 verse 18 and 19 he says to proclaim the acceptable accept, acceptable year of the lord and he stops there he did not complete verse 19 verse 19 says the whole verse 19 supposedly from isaiah chapter 61 says to proclaim the acceptable year of the lord and the vengeance of the lord our god Now why did the Lord Jesus stop before the phrase the vengeance of the Lord because he came to bring grace and truth it was not the time for vengeance the time for vengeance is reserved for our days the end times but he came to bring grace and truth the first part of his life that is why Luke 4:18 and 19 was not completely fulfilled in the Lord Jesus but the second part reserved for this last days and this last days you and I are going to be anointed or to be blessed with this Luke 4:18 and we will fulfilled all the works in 4:18 4:19 Amen. Now there are seven parts to this model of uh, Luke four eighteen. What are they? Number one, the spirit of the Lord is upon me. That's the first thing. The spirit of the Lord is upon me. Now, the Holy Spirit manifests Himself in seven forms. We read this in. Isaiah chapter 11 verse 1 and 2 and we also read in Revelation chapter 4 verse 5 that the apostle John while in heaven he saw the seven manifestations of the holy spirit as seven lamps that were burning before the throne of God not only seven lamps but the seven lamps were of seven colors each color symbolizes one work of the holy spirit so what are the seven spirits of the lord the spirit of the lord the spirit of wisdom the spirit of revelation the spirit of counsel the spirit of might the spirit of knowledge and the spirit of the fear of the lord seven spirits and which is the first one the spirit of the lord now when the spirit of the lord comes He doesn't come alone. He brings his retinue together. If you invite Pastor Sweet to your house for a meal, will he come alone? Yeah. No. He brings Mrs. Sweet. Yeah. So Pastor Sweet, Mrs. Sweet, two sweets. <laughs> That's double sweet, right? Yeah. Sweet square. <laughs> so they don't come alone, right? You know, they, we have a very wonderful custom in india when a person has a wedding right so they come and give you a wedding invitation 
and they'll write on the invitation, the name. Let's say, for example, they're inviting me, right? Okay, we pass a suite. Um, okay. I'll give an Indian uh, illustration, okay? There's one of our partners here called Moses. Moses Sankar. He has a wonderful wife and two beautiful boys. So that's four in the family, right? So the wedding cut, they say, Moses Sankar and family. So which means you don't, you're not invited alone. You bring your whole family, whether it's two, three, 10 or 20. So the whole family comes along. In the same manner, when the spirit of the Lord comes, he doesn't come alone. He brings all the seven spirits all at the same time. So the spirit of the Lord. Now the spirit of the Lord is something that is reserved for these last days. The Holy Spirit poured in us in a measure. But in these last days, the seven spirits of the Lord are going to be poured out upon the body of Christ, upon each individual, just like how the Lord Jesus Christ was anointed with all the seven spirits of the Lord. Now, what is the spirit of the Lord? It is the baptism of the Holy Spirit in a measure. The Lord Jesus Christ was baptized with the Holy Spirit. Matthew chapter 3 verse 16. And when a person is baptized with the Holy Spirit, the Bible tells us in 1 Samuel chapter 10 verse 6 that you will be changed into another person. You'll be changed into another person. The prophet Samuel spoke to Saul. He said, now I have anointed you as king over Israel, but go to this particular place and you will meet a company of prophets and they will be prophesying. When you meet them, you'll be changed into another person. So Saul follows according what prophet Samuel said and he meets this company of prophets as, and this company of prophets comes down a mountain they were singing, they were worshipping God, and they were prophesying at the same time. As soon as they were quite close to Saul, that anointing came upon Saul. You know what is that? That's called the corporate anointing. Corporate anointing. It rests upon the whole group. And when you come near the group, it comes upon you. A very good example is what Pastor Sweet shared, shared with us earlier about a group of people who heard him in which part of California? Los Angeles. Los Angeles. Right? They just heard the message. They saw it on YouTube and they came under that corporate anointing. And they carried that anointing to their own church. And they experienced the same result. So this proves that the mathematical formula works. That this is the right formula. Amen. Amen. If something that just works for one church, then we can say, we cannot say it applies to everybody across the board. But this formula works for another church. It will work for all churches. Amen. Amen. So, when the Spirit of the Lord comes upon you, you'll be changed into another person. Change to what? Now presently, when the Spirit of the Lord comes upon us, we only speak in tongues. Right? Yeah. But, when this Luke 4.18 anointing comes, you'll be changed over to another person where you'll see visions and you will prophesy. The fulfillment of Joel 2, 28. Yes. Reserved for these last days. Your spiritual eyes will be opened. And you will begin to prophesy. Besides speaking in tongues. Yes. Speaking in tongues is just the basic kindergarten Christianity. Yes. 
Don't just be stuck there. There is another level. Another level reserved for these last days. And the Lord Jesus Christ counseled his disciples to wait for the baptism of the Holy Spirit in Acts chapter 1 verses 4 and 8. They were so anxious to know about the end times. Say, Lord, when will you come back again? When will you restore the kingdom back to Israel? So he told them, don't worry about all that. I have another work for you to do. Wait in Jerusalem. Wait for the promise of my father to come. And I will send you the promise. And when the promise comes, you will receive power. Period. And what is that power? Luke 4, 18. Luke 4, 18. You will receive power. The Lord Jesus did not say, when the Holy Spirit comes upon you, you shall all speak in tongues, lift up your hands and worship the Lord God. Did he say that? No. He said, you shall receive power. So why aren't we thought like that? Amen. Why? Why are we thought that we will only speak in tongues? Something wrong, isn't it? Yeah. It's all right. Today, it will be changed. Yeah. Today, yeah. or in the next three days, yeah. you will be changed to another man yeah. or another woman. Yeah. Amen. Do you believe? Yes. You'll be changed yes. into another person. Yes. How many of you want that? Yes. But are you willing to pay the price? Yes. Okay, listen carefully. This is the price. The price is for the next three days. Friday night. Saturday morning till evening and then Saturday night and then Sunday morning before the service. So there's three days, right? If possible, you fast and pray. If not possible to fast, pray ardently. Do not waste your time talking stories with your neighbors, with your friends whom you have not met for a long time. You can do all the talking after the Sunday service. You're welcome to stay in beautiful Lancaster. Where there's no rain. <laughs> you know why we are in the desert? Prophets always reside in the deserts. And Shekinah is a prophetic church. So where else should she be? In the desert. <laughs> so... This is the price. Are you willing to pay the price? Yes. So pray sincerely. Lord, I should not leave Lancaster empty-handed. Amen. That should be your earnest prayer. You came empty. You should not go back empty. Unless you just want to be a spectator all your life. Then it doesn't matter, you know. Do you want to be a spectator? No. Okay, when you, when you go to watch a baseball game, or a football game, or a basketball game, who gets the most money? The spectator or the player? <laughs> the player, right? They make crazy money, you know. Yeah. Isn't it? Just play, by playing games. They don't work hard. They just play games. Kick some balls, kick some people. <laughs> Push somebody down. For that, they paid millions of dollars. Wouldn't you like a job like that? You throw a ball and you make millions of dollars. You know, the Olympics just ended, right? There was one um, javelin thrower the, who won the gold medal. It's from India. So just for winning the gold medal, he was rewarded by the government 3 million US dollars. Just by throwing the javelin. I thought to myself, no, oh, I should have thrown javelins. <laughs> 3 million. 3 million US dollars as a reward. 
But listen, behind that, how many years of practice? Sleepless nights. Sleepless night. Do you know who is Simone Biles? The great US gymnast. I saw her biography test. They made a movie of her life, you know. I watched that movie when I was flying from um, Cincinnati to Los Angeles. That poor girl, from her young age, she sacrificed all her dreams. She couldn't go to a high school. She couldn't go hang out with her friends. She couldn't go for no boyfriend, no nothing. Her one goal was to be a top gymnast. What a dedication. I was so amazed when I looked at her life. And then I pondered, you know, how many of us are paying such prices? Yes. How many? She became a world-renowned gymnast because she paid a price. And she won a perishable gold medal. Yeah. But you will get an imperishable gold crown. Yeah. But wait, wait. But how much are we paying in the price? How much? Or you're just thinking the crown will be put on your head just like that. No, it doesn't work like that. It doesn't work like that. You'll be sorely disappointed that it doesn't work like that. Narrow is the gate that leads to life. Narrow, very narrow. It's so narrow that if you miss a step, you'll fall down, hit long. And anyone at any stage of their life whether he's the most highly anointed man or woman of God or just an ordinary believer, they can fall at any time. Any time. There's no guarantee that the saintliest man of God will never fall. Look at Prophet Moses for an example. Right? The man who saw the glory of God, who talked with God face to face, was even caught up to heaven and was in the glory of God for 40 days and 40 nights. No one in history till today has had that privilege. That is why God says in Exodus, uh, sorry, Deuteronomy chapter 34 verse 10, there was no one like Moses whom God knew face to face. And for a person who walked in that realm, he made a mistake, right? And he fell. And he lost the privilege of entering into the promised land. So if he can fall, what about us? That is why the Lord Jesus said in Matthew chapter 24, verse 13, he endures till the end. So till the end, till the last breath in your nostril, contend for your faith. Contend for your faith. Never lose sight of your faith that was entrusted to you at the beginning of your salvation. Hold on to that. And never give up for anything. So the Lord Jesus told them to wait. So, wait. Persevere in prayer. Earnestly pray, Lord, I want this. I will not let you go until you bless me with that. That should be your tenacity. You should have a bulldog faith. A bulldog doesn't let go, you know. Right? You need that. Bite until the Lord says, please let me go. I will bless you. Do you have an example of that in the Bible? Yes. Who? Yes. Right? See, the poor angel had to beg Jacob, let me go, please. It's time I need to report. He said, no, 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 no. You first bless me. Then I will let you go. You need that bulldog faith. Amen. Amen. And the baptism of the Holy Spirit was an essential experience in the early church. Acts chapter 8, verse 14 to 15. Chapter 9, verse 17. Chapter 10, verses 44 to 46. And chapter 19, verse 2 and 6 
so much so it is a primary requirement the moment you are safe you are water baptized and your spirit baptized requirement but today how many believers are spirit baptized like that in most churches in 1986 i was invited to minister at a pentecostal church and the pastor has a great reputation in that region so he was like a bishop you know he had established 100 churches in the whole region and established five academic schools and three orphanages so when i went to his church i asked a simple question how many of you are baptized in the holy spirit so there were about 150 members in the church how many of you are baptized in the holy spirit only 10 people put up their hands and who are that 10 you know the pastor his wife and other eight very old members in the church i was shock i said i thought maybe they didn't understand what i said you know sometimes you know british accent just like you all do you understand me yes. oh that must be the gift of the holy spirit <laughs> so i rephrase my question in a very simple manner again 10 hands went up 140 people who were born again in a pentecostal church were not filled in the holy spirit and the pastor the senior pastor was interpreting for me so i looked at the pastor i said this is the most unpentecostal pentecostal church <laughs> that i have that i have ever been to i was shocked you know in our ministry i have a policy anyone who comes to work for me must be baptized in the holy spirit if you come from a traditional church so we have a orientation week so during the orientation week which lasts for 5 days i require them to fast for 5 days whether they like it or they don't like it you are forced to fast and during those five days at the end on the fifth day we will pray for them to be baptized in the holy spirit and we will make sure that every one of them is baptized in the holy spirit no one works in our ministry who is not baptized in the holy spirit i make this a must in our ministry you know even if uh, by perchance some non christians come to work which had happened once in the past and during one a prayer meeting they were gloriously filled in the holy spirit so it is very important to be filled in the holy spirit to have every member in the church even your little children filled in the holy spirit don't expect the church to do all the teaching you who know the word should prepare the next generation your children and your children's children you should do parents should do their work grandparents should do their homework not expect the church to do all the work you do your work outside and then come into the temple this was the requirement given to king solomon no knocking should be done in the temple all cutting of stones all the knocking should be done outside which means every form of repentance should all be done outside and you enter into the church as the priest of the lord priest of the lord to worship god to offer spiritual sacrifices that was the pattern that was set the holy spirit those of you who are already baptized in the holy spirit he should have the preeminence in your lives in these last days is no more you you should no more live your lives you should no more be the boss of your life galatians 220 
should become the standard in your life. So, here is a homework for you for this conference. I require you to memorize Galatians 2.20. On Sunday, I will ask you one by one. Okay? All agreed? So, I hope none of you will escape or miss Sunday service. It's not difficult to memorize that simple scripture. It should be the foundation of your life for these last days. Galatians 2.20. If you don't build your life on Galatians 2.20, I dare say to you, you will not survive the end times. You will not survive. Not only that, you will not even enter into heaven. Galatians 2.20. It's no longer I that lives, but Christ Jesus who lives in me. And the life which I now live by, which I live, I live by faith of the Son of God who loves me and gave himself for me. This should be your standard. Amen? Amen. Number two, anointed. The Spirit of the Lord is upon me. He has anointed so there comes an anointing which is the power after the baptism of the Holy Spirit. There are two separate experiences. Luke chapter 4 verses 1 to 2. Please turn your Bibles to Luke chapter 4 verses 1 to 2. Now this is another important scripture for you to understand. Then Jesus, been filled with the Holy Spirit. <coughs> now look at this scripture very carefully. The Lord Jesus Christ was already filled with the Holy Spirit. Am I right? Yes. So filled with the Holy Spirit, he returned from the Jordan and was led by the Spirit. Now underline the word led by the Spirit. See, that tells you that the Holy Spirit was, had the preeminence in the life of the Lord Jesus Christ. Led by the Holy Spirit into the wilderness. Where are you all now? Wilderness. See, how prophetic, isn't it? Right. Verse 2. Being tempted for 40 days by the devil, and in those days he ate nothing, and afterward, when they had ended, he was hungry. Now, when the Lord Jesus Christ came out of the fast, the Bible tells us in Luke chapter 4, verse 14, he returned with the power of God. Now, look at verse 14. Then Jesus returned in the power of the Spirit to Galilee. Now let's pause here. I want you to look at verse 1 and make a comparison with verse 14. Verse 1 says, Then Jesus been filled with the Holy Spirit. That's experience number 1. And then verse 14 says, He returned in the power of the Holy Spirit. That's experience number 2. And what happened in between? There was a 40 days fast. He went through a 40 days fast. He was led to the wilderness. Now, what does that mean? It means a wilderness is a place of dryness which will produce thirst. Dryness, thirst, which means you must feel dry and thirsty and cry for the power of God unless and until you feel dry and thirsty you're not going to get it yeah. see there's a price dry and thirsty every man and woman of God in history and let me give you some examples like William Branham T.L. Osborne, 
A. A. Allen. These three men of God who are mightily used by God in signs and wonders in the United States. They all came to a place of dry and empty. Dry and empty. And they made a decision. You know, there was a sign on the board asking everybody to turn off their cell phones. And then Pastor Sweet mentioned that everyone should turn off their cell phones. And yet, there are some who are still very disobedient, unwilling to turn off your cell phones. And this is the second time since I got up here, a cell phone rang. Why is it that we cannot obey simple instruction? If you cannot obey this simple instruction, how you, are you going to obey what the Lord will tell you? Please, learn obedience, which is another missing ingredient in today's Christian life. We cannot obey. We don't want to obey. So please kindly make sure your mobile phones are turned off, not even put on silence. When you come to the house of God, you're coming to hear God, right? Not hear your phone ringing. So why do you need that silly, stupid phone when you come into the house of God? Why do you need that? You can just leave it in your car, right? Please do that tomorrow. Can you obey? Yes. All right. So, in the lives of William Brenham, T. L. Osborne, A. A. Allen, I've read their biographies, you know. They hit rock bottom. They all were having good ministries. But they hit a rock bottom because they knew there was something greater than simply preaching the gospel. There's something greater. They came to a place, Lord, this is not what we want. Dry and thirsty. And all these three men that I read about their lives, they made a do and die decision. All the three of them were already married by then. So they told their wives, I'm going to seek God. If I find him, I will come back home. If I don't find him, don't send the kids to look for me. That was the tenacity, not even tenacity, the amount of hunger, thirst that they had. William Brenham went into the woods and he fasted and he prayed and he sought God. Till Osborne and A. A. Allen, they went into their bedrooms or in their closet room. They told their wives, even if I knock the door, don't open the door. And A. A. Allen's wife laughed when he said that because he had said that in the past and after three hours, he'll come knocking on the door and ask her, what's for lunch? <laughs> so she thought, okay, one, one of these days. And 11 days passed by and he never came out of the room until he met with God. And when he eventually came out of the room to see his wife, the wife told him, you don't need to tell me anything. I can see the glory of God all over your face. <laughs> his face was shining with light. And she said, I know you have met with God. And that was a turning point in his life. All the great signs and wonders that happened in A.A. A. Allen's life and T.L. Osborne's life was a result of meeting with God. Hungry, thirsty. And let me share with you also about the experience of Kenneth E. Hagin. Now he was already feeling the Holy Spirit, but his calling is different. He was not, a, he was not like them with a the public ministry, but he was a church-based ministry, right? But one day, 
he became very hungry and thirsty after reading the book of Ephesians, where he read in Ephesians chapter 1, verse 17, the prayer that the Apostle Paul prayed for the Ephesian church, and the Lord will fill you with the spirit of wisdom and revelation, that the eyes of your understanding will be enlightened, that you may know what is the hope of your calling, and what are the riches of the glory of your inheritance in the saints, and what is the exceeding greatness of your mighty power that is available for you. He read these prayers, two prayers, one in chapter 1 and one in chapter 3. He read it, and he read it, and he felt convinced inside him he wanted that. So he told his wife, I know when is dinner time. I know when dinner time comes, I will come. Don't send the kids to look for me. And he would go into the church from the parsonage and pray the whole day. Never came out of the church. Sometimes the whole nights, whole days, several weeks passed by like that. One day, the Lord appeared to him. And the Lord said, because you sincerely followed me or searched me, from today onwards, I will bless you with these gifts. From today onwards, the spirit of wisdom and revelation will abundantly manifest in your life. From that day onwards, he stepped into the ministry of a prophet. From that day onwards, he saw things with open eyes, open visions. See, this turnaround came about because of a dry and thirsty heart. Dry and thirsty heart. You are sick and tired of your mundane Christian life. Are you? Yes. Your, I hope your answer is a genuine yes. And not just a conference yes. You know what's the difference between a conference yes and a genuine yes? In a conference, everybody's in a frenzy. Are you yes? Yes. But you don't actually mean yes. This is the key. Dry and thirsty land. Psalms chapter 42. As the deer pants after the brook, so does my soul long after you, O Lord my God. As the deer pants for water, the deer walks the length and the breadth of the wilderness and becomes so dry and thirsty. Even a little trickle of a stream, it will lap very hungrily. You must come to that place. I, I want something more, Lord. Not just this mundane life. Remember, you can be changed into another person. Not just an ordinary fireman. Change into a real fireman. Who calls on fire like the prophet Elijah. Not someone who distinguishes fire. It's for you. If you dare take it. Do you believe that? Yes. It's for you. Yes. The door is open. Waiting for you to step through. It's open. Right? Yes. The door was first opened when the Lord Jesus Christ died on the cross. Hebrews chapter 10 verses 19 to 22 says, A way has been made into the holy of holies. A general door was opened. Then there are other little doors. Now a little door for Luke 4, 18 opened. And the angels, I tell you one truth today. At every season, before every move of God is released, special angels are appointed to accompany, to bring those moves. And this are very powerful angels. Not just ordinary ones, you know. And for this season, mighty angels are waiting behind the door. I see them right now as I'm speaking to you. These angels are so huge and they look quite similar to the Lord Jesus. From the crown of their head to the sole of their feet, they are just golden golden and they look like the Lord Jesus 
and their, their robes are golden, signifying the glory that they carry. And when you step into the door, this angel will be assigned to you. And they'll come and stand beside you when you are going to minister to people. Yes. Pray to the people. Yes. They'll release that anointing. Yes. They are the carriers for that anointing. And the Holy Spirit now signifies to me that during this conference, angels of God have been appointed to study each and every one of you. All those whose heart will be willing. Willing. And they will be numbered. And I also see the Holy Spirit standing right here before me like the Spirit of the Lord Jesus. And he's looking at each and every one of you to see the inner motives of your heart. How much you love the Lord Jesus Christ with all your heart. Secondly, how much you desire the things of God. Stop, stop that. Thirdly, how much you are hastening the soon coming of the Lord Jesus Christ. 